Greece today stands at a crossroads. Its ailing economy on the brink of meltdown just a couple of years ago appears to be on a bumpy road to recovery. In the summer of 2012, we came to find out how the country's biggest industry, tourism, was faring in the crisis. And as the provider of one in five jobs, how much it could contribute to the country's recovery. I met people who are deeply affected by the collapse in tourism, like a hotelier in Athens who was on the brink of closing down his family business, and a young entrepreneur in Crete who was trying to launch a new tourism project in spite of the crisis. Now in 2014, I've returned to Greece to see if their businesses have survived and to see if tourists are returning to a country that was in the headlines for all the wrong reasons on my last visit. Ever since the financial crisis first gripped the world five years ago, it's Greece that has been at the epicentre of the Eurozone's woes. Extreme austerity measures have hit hard, leaving more than a quarter of people here out of work. But there are signs of greater stability for this year, and crucially, 2013 saw record numbers of international tourist arrivals to Greece. And let's face it, nobody wants to see a return to the despair and disharmony epitomised by events in this square just four years ago. Athens was the theatre of the most dramatic scenes of the crisis, images which were continually replayed in international media. Demonstrations and mass strikes followed deep public spending cuts and conditions only got worse after tougher austerity measures imposed by bailout deals with the European Union. During the summer of 2012, many small family-run businesses in the heart of the capital felt the brunt of the economic pain. Costas Avrabos and his son Yanis were running this hotel and two others in the historic centre of Athens, not far from the Acropolis, but also very close to the main areas of criminality and destitution. When I first met them, Costas had been in the hotel game for over 40 years, but was harbouring serious doubts about survival. Room occupancy was down to 35% from a previous average of 85 to 90%. He'd been physically attacked in the street and was suffering badly from diabetes. But it was the welfare of his employees that concerned him most. We're very close to shutting down. We're struggling and making a lot of sacrifices. But it's not just about us. When a hotel closes, there are sometimes hundreds of employees that will lose their jobs. That is the saddest thing. Let's see your room then. Give me an example of that. Costas's son, Yanis, then showed me around his family's four-star boutique hotel, Chic, where only 14 out of 51 rooms were occupied. Wow. It's stylish, isn't it? Yeah, like this. Than, uh... The family had spent millions on building and renovating their properties and complained it was the smaller independent family businesses, not the big chains, that were feeling the heat. The banks are closing the doors to the small business and the big companies doesn't have this kind of problems. The government treats them special. They have a special treatment from the government also, from the system. It's how the system works. We have... Uh, emotions with our business. Big companies and in the market, they don't have emotions and feelings. They just go for the numbers. What really struck me then was that small hotels are a vital part of the ecosystem of tourism in Greece. And some 18 months later, on my return, I saw a much more positive father and son, with all hotels open, occupancy rates up, and most staff still in jobs. We have uh, tried and find solutions. We have worked more. It's a family business. So we have uh, almost, we have lived in our 
uh, hotels. As we see in the tourist industry, the city center, the historical center of Athens, the, the government have uh, realized that uh, the most important uh, promotion for our country and for our city is the security and the safety on the streets where the people will explore and see all the monuments, the museums, the sightings of the city center. And we have seen that they have uh, do very good work. They have 24 hours police patrols. We feel safe again in uh, our city. Throughout the centuries, Athens has traditionally banked on a steady flow of tourists drawn by its classical heritage. Greek is Europe's oldest written language, but when I walked the streets of the historic quarter back in 2012, it might not have been its finest moment. Graffiti, particularly political tagging, was defacing this ancient capital. One of the unsavoury byproducts of the Greek debt crisis has been the epidemic of graffiti all around the city. Most of it is not very clever, nor funny, nor very grown up. But nonetheless, in wiping the slate clean, there is a kind of symbolic benefit. Deputy Mayor Andreas Varelis has been leading the drive to purge Athens of any visual pollution, at least in popular tourist haunts like this ancient cemetery in the historic centre. One hot afternoon in the summer of 2012, I gave him a hand. OK, so I did the paint. Yes. And you? <laughs> we'll do that. OK. We've now got people who offer guided tours for tourists and also volunteers who are cleaning places that the local authorities don't manage to get round to on a regular basis. People have adopted these places as their own. Andreas felt that what really needed repainting were stereotyped images about Greeks. Then. There's a myth that we want to embezzle money out of the Europeans. We don't. We want to pay them back, but without being in this prolonged recession, which only creates more unemployment. So, two years on, in spite of the deputy mayor's efforts, are the graffitied political tags still despoiling the walls of Athens' ancient cemetery? Um, yes, very much so, although the cleaning squads are still out in force. By 2012, many people had been dissuaded from visiting Greece after all the negative news coverage and rumours of empty cash machines. So I met with the tourism minister to ask what were her big ideas to lead the national fight back. Our short-term goal is to uh, give this message that Greece is back to business, that everything here is uh, normal as ever and that the visitor will enjoy their vacation. Uh, but the long-term goals are to uh, have better infrastructure, better tourism infrastructure, marinas, golf courses. Today, that short-term goal has been largely achieved. Athens is a much safer place. And indeed, the latest tourism numbers are at record levels. But what about the infrastructure and the desire to make more of Greece as an all-year-round destination? That's what I wanted to ask the Tourism Minister on my return. First of all, we would uh, like to uh, uh, be able to tackle seasonality. 
Uh, so definitely we, we want to bring uh, people to Athens outside the summer months. Uh, if you ask me, I think it's a much better experience because of course uh, the weather is moderate year round. Uh, so you can have a, a, a very nice walk up the Parthenon without really <laughs> the heat, uh, uh, which in the summer months can sometimes be uh, really uh, strong. Um, and, um, and also, Mm, this is why we are trying to approach new source markets. Of course, the traditional source markets for Greek tourism are the European markets, but we're opening up to uh, new uh, markets, the Russian market, uh, Turkey, which is uh, a neighboring country, and they can visit Athens just an hour away. Uh, so um, the, the strategy is also to approach new source markets. And it's hoped that tax cuts will also encourage people to think about booking a trip here. Nothing pulls in punters like saving a little bit of cash. And the recent near halving of VAT in restaurants and cafes has made food and coffee just that little bit cheaper. Well, there's no doubt Athens is in better shape these days. Greater police presence in key areas of the city has nurtured a sense of calm and even optimism amongst hoteliers and others in the tourism game. But this ancient metropolis still has a long way to go to compete as a weekend break destination with the likes of Rome, Paris and London. And you do worry that like the country's finances, it's all still a little precarious. One big noisy protest against further austerity during these six months when Greece is president of the EU and it might just be back to square one. Coming up, we revisit Thessaloniki where thanks to courting visitors from the east rather than the recession ravaged west, optimism was higher. And we catch up with the woman who had a big idea about how to kickstart the recovery in Crete. Food is a new sex, you know, sex now is so liberated. How did she get on? got classical civilization and wonderful coastlines, but tourism in Greece suffered during the first few years of the Eurozone crisis. We witnessed this firsthand when we went there in the summer of 2012, but we also saw cause for hope outside the capital Athens that travel and tourism could be the one sector to pull the country out of its economic malaise. I flew from Athens to Greece's second city, Thessaloniki, in the north. While all eyes were on the disarray and discord in Athens, Thessaloniki quietly went about its business. What helped was 2012 mark the centenary of Thessaloniki's liberation and incorporation into Greece. It was yanked from the ruins of a spent Ottoman Empire in a huge Balkan bun fight. 
Nowadays, its colourful and eventful past is shaping its tourist future. The basis of life is relaxed. It's not so hectic as in Athens. The old fish market is at the very heart of the city. Thessaloniki has always been an important commercial centre. And it's always had one trump card. One reason why this part of Greece, the north by the Aegean coast, keeps those visitor numbers up is that many of those visitors don't just come from the west. They come from the east, Eastern Europe, Russia, Israel and Turkey. And you can see why they feel so at home here. It's all down to history. The Turkish connection is tight. The main symbol of the city, the White Tower, was built by the Ottomans, and the founder of modern Turkey, Mustafa Kemal, was born here. People were not coming and destroying the history in the past. They were building on it. And there were these communities living together until the beginning of the 20th century, until the big, big world war started. In 1923, a huge enforced exchange of ethnic Turks and Greeks between the two countries also led to strong family ties, symbolized by a simple cup of coffee. Spiros' refugee grandparents call it Turkish coffee, his parents Greek. Either way, it's incredibly strong. In 2014, Spiros's party are still at the helm in Thessaloniki, and this city and the surrounding region have benefited tremendously from a huge influx of tourists from Turkey, Eastern Europe, and especially Russia. It's their hub. It's the place where their religion, their civilization started from. So they see it with a lot of respect and a lot of love. And that's why you see so many Russians going to Thessaloniki, Kalkidiki, all the area around. They love this area. And this is a huge potential for us. And from Thessaloniki, we moved on to another part of Greece with a long and checkered history and a similarly traumatic period during the Second World War, Crete. Mass tourism, package tourism, backpackers, and a great number of yoga and meditation retreats have become Crete's staple diet. It's bread and butter, if you like. But resourceful Greeks are now realizing their unique natural produce and traditional culinary prowess can help reboot and redefine tourism on this island. <laughs> In 2012, I saw how important fresh food was to the lure of this island. Uh, he has seven small gardens like this. They, they use in the kitchen, they use what they uh, produce. So what do we have here? Uh, he has carrots, uh, beans, tomatoes. From vineyards to allotments, Crete has a long tradition of local fresh produce, creating the classical healthy Mediterranean diet. I met this entrepreneur who felt that culinary tourism was going to be the next big thing for the island. There is this expression, I use it usually when I do presentations about food is a new sex. You know, sex now is so liberated. Food is a difficult thing, you know, get a nice plate of uh, food, uh, a tasty one, uh, local ingredients is what is difficult. And one of the things that visitors are looking for is to taste what is local. Also the tastes and the, the different recipes and the ingredients, they like to know where their food came from. And out of the frying pan, into our mouths. Food cooked in Crete's finest export, olive oil. So this is a 2,000-year-old tree from Africa. Here are olive tree. Zoe had dumped her high-flying government post to pursue her dream and was busy planning a culinary tourism centre in a tiny village nearby. She was convinced diversity had to replace an over-reliance on sun, sea and sand in her native Crete. 
I want to create a center for culinary tourism and, and you know, like activities for tourists. We don't have a lot of that here. So I would run uh, cooking seminars or uh, wine tasting, food tasting, and just to get people to know uh, the local traditions there and the culture with, in an interactive way. And like many young Greeks, her passion stemmed from disillusionment with the older generation. Love for her own country meant she had no intention of leaving for another one, even when the offers were there. The ship is sinking, and if we all abandon, you know, no one will be there to help us, help Greece, help our islands, our communities to stand back on their feet. And it's like, you either stay here and fight, or you leave, and then you come back to what? There is nothing to come back to. Back in Athens, I met up with Zoe again. This is where she now lives. The dream still alive, but delayed, because vital European funding and bank loans didn't materialise, and she couldn't afford to restore her premises. It took me a long time to actually accept the fact that it wasn't a good idea anymore, because I started with this dream, I was full of enthusiasm, I had quit my job working with the local government, I was seeing as this enterprise would be my way into a happier life, a more fulfilling life, and it was also a very nice project. So. Uh, I was in denial for quite a long time and then I, I went through the phase where I was angry at the system, the crisis, I couldn't get this loan, I had this very nice idea that's, and that's something that happens to a lot of entrepreneurs at this point. And then I had to go through the emotions that I felt that I was a, it was a personal failure, I didn't do it right, I should have you know, seen this coming, I shouldn't have left my job, all this stuff. And a despondent Zoe even toyed with going against her own philosophy by quitting Greece. It came where I lost my courage and I did think about going abroad. And it was actually my own words that made me think that, you know, if I leave too, at that point it felt safer because at least I thought maybe I can go abroad, I can earn more money that I w than I will if I stay here and then I can finish off the investment later on. But then it's like it beats the purpose because I one of the reasons I wanted to stay here is because I love Greece so much. I believe in this concept of culinary tourism. I believe in the local products. Um, so I decided to stay, but yes, there was this time where I really felt like running away. It's not just cuisine, but culture that the country wants to promote. This is the brand new National Museum of Contemporary Art, due to open in early summer 2014. It's been funded in large part by the European Union, and is a symbol of renewed, if cautious, optimism about Greece's future. So I've reached the end of my return visit to Greece and the main thing that strikes me is that stability is key to the future recovery of this country, especially when it comes to tourism. People want to be continually reassured that not only is this a value for money destination, but also a safe one. I've seen the mixed fortunes of small business owners and entrepreneurs and I realise how much hope is being invested in tourism as the main source of recovery for this country. But with unemployment, especially for the young, at frightening levels, it's pretty clear that patience is limited. 2014 is going to be a critical year.